Welcome aboard to NJ.com here. Joe Giulio with you. We have a special guest uh, from down in Houston, Texas, Matt Hammond, an ex Sayreville High School athlete, a football player on the team at Sayreville, uh, is going to join us here. He wrote a piece for CBSHouston.com uh, kind of detailing his experiences when he played at Sayreville uh, not too long ago uh, and with the message he kind of wanted to get out about that and, and his perspective on the school. Matt, how are you this afternoon? I'm really good, Joe. Thanks for having me on. Well, happy to have you. I enjoyed your piece on uh, CBS Houston, and uh, I thought it shed some light on your perspective on the school and, and your experience there. So first, tell us a little about yourself and, and when you did play at Sayreville High School. Uh, in 2003, uh, I played for the team. Uh, I had transferred in from a parochial high school in the area after my freshman year in 2002, so I spent 2003 to 2006 at uh, Sayreville War Memorial and uh, was proud to graduate there. Matt, what can you tell us about the head coach there? That you know, he's been there for so long. He's been very successful, and uh, now his program is under some turmoil here. And uh, it is disappointing to hear. It. And the whole thing has just been a sad story, as you wrote in your piece. What can you tell us about your experience uh, with the head coach of the program? Um, really good guy. He was uh, he was a man of integrity. He was God fearing. He was, um, you know, he seemed like just. kids, somebody who's responsible for the welfare of kids, um, somebody who is helps shape people, you know, kids in, into men. Um, you know, he was, he was a really good guy. And that was, that was, you know, obviously I was only with the program for a year. Um, but if I was there for 15 minutes or for four years, I don't think the impression would have been any different. He did, you know, he, he struck you as a, as a really good guy. Um, you know, he was, he was always accessible. Um, you know, I know that there were a number of times. There, there were a few times that I had to, uh, you know, I had to, I had to talk to, to him about some things. Obviously, nothing of this magnitude or nothing this serious. But you know, there were things that I needed to check in with the head coach about. And you know, he always had an open door policy. Uh, you know, it's important to remember when I played for the team in 2003, I was a nobody. I was a practice squad player. I was small, and there was, you know, there was no expectation that I was going to get any bigger. So, in terms of a future prospect. Um, it, it wasn't like it made it convenient to be there for me, or, or there was an incentive to be there for me. Um, you know, when I had to, you know, when I had to talk to him about things, and when I need, felt like I needed to, you know, share things with him, um, you know, he did it because I was a member of the team and because it was the right thing to do. So, um, you know, we, we obviously still don't know the answer to the who, know, what, and when question. And I think, despite anybody's precognitions of of who George was um, and any feelings they may have, I think it's really important to just approach things moving forward with a really open mind um, and, and let's you know let's see what, what, what this investigation shows um, and so far you know I've been I've been really pleased to see the way that you know the administration the school board um, and even even some of the investigators have, have, have handled the case and, and, and it seems like they're on the right track um, so you know moving forward it's really important that everybody keep an open mind but that being said you know for an obligatory character assessment of of George Najar, he was a you know he was a, he was a great A human being. Matt Hammond, CBS Houston, uh, he's a sports talk host and a, a sports personality writer on the website. He had a piece uh, detailing his time at Sayreville High School this past week, and uh, Matt's with us now to talk about the program, his experience there. And I think the question that keeps coming up, Matt, is how did no coach know about this? How did no administrator know that something was going on? Whether whatever those details are, we'll find out. And uh, an investigation is going on, but how did you know? No coach. You no, know, I played high school football. You played at Sayreville. Uh, from your experience, were coaches around the locker room at all, whether head coach or assistants? When I played, the head coach wasn't usually in the locker room, but assistants would walk around, especially the younger ones that weren't too much older than the players. From time to time, uh, in Sayreville, coaches in the locker room or not there? No. Uh, from what I can remember, um, and this is something that I wrote in my piece, uh, I can count on two hands the number of times that there was a coach in the locker room. It was only ever. Uh, George, and that was to lead, you know, an only sort of vaguely religious pregame prayer um, on game days. Um, there, there really was no presence in the locker room, and I think it's also important to note that, in, from my experience, that's that's typical. Um, I played football, uh, played football my freshman year, 2003, uh, in 2002, excuse me, at a local parochial school, and I was essentially part of two locker rooms because I was not only a part of the freshman locker room, but later in the year I kicked for the varsity team. Um, and so, yeah, it was technically the same building, but um, it was the same room. But in terms of the mix of people and personalities and culture, 
um, I was essentially a part of two different locker rooms, and there there, there wasn't a coaching presence. Um, and it's also worth noting that none of us at the time felt like that was odd. None of us wondered where was you know a sort of adult supervisory role type presence. I understand we were 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, and to expect kids to have that kind of self awareness that's a separate conversation. But um, from my experience, their presence in the locker room. Um, you know, it was pretty minimal, but that was also pretty typical. Now, that being said, um, I have a really hard time trying to process and understand and deal with the idea that no one was able to see the signs. Um, the things that we're talking about, the things that we're describing, this isn't hurt feelings. This isn't jokes um, that, that may have been taken the right or wrong way. This isn't um, you know, even some of the emotional strain of a football player trying to, to win his place on the team or overcome an injury or overcome, you know, just a rut, poor performance, slump. Um, this is, you know, it's something, it's something different. And I just have a really hard time reconciling, you know, the people that I knew and the care that they had and what I would assume them to, to be able to see and what, and how they would react to that with, what I have to believe were these kids' reactions, were these kids' faces, body language, um, and the works. And again, this is something that, you know, local investigators, and, and, and this is something that hopefully that local investigation, you know, teases out. But, um, you know, without, without passing any judgment, without um, wagging the finger at anybody, just, just objectively, um, I just have a really hard time understanding how how nobody saw the signs. And to that end, um, you know, to make sure that this isn't a witch hunt and to make sure that we're not, you know, calling for people's jobs and making value judgment of men's character and, you know, that sort of thing. I think it's really important that when we talk about moving forward, the systematic cracks that allowed this to happen and the systematic failures that allowed this to happen and how we shore them up, education is going to be really important. Education for coaches so that they can understand and see the signs education for kids so that they can get an understanding, even at a young age, this isn't okay. This isn't, these aren't jokes. This isn't razzing. This isn't ribbing. Um, this is, this is abuse. This is torment. This is the stuff that tears lives apart. Um, and so, you know, whether you, whether you want to say that someone should have known or someone should have been able to see or, 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 or any of that. I mean, it's really important that moving forward, you know, like, I'll say this, there have been 74 school shootings since Sandy. There can't be 74 more cerebral high schools. There needs to be change. There needs to be reform. I don't know how sweeping it needs to be. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. But there needs to be change on some level. Um, and, and, and these are the types of conversations that we need to make sure that we're having while also talking about who is ultimately responsible at cerebral specifically. Matt Hammond, CBS Houston, he's with us, an ex Sayreville student, ex New Jersey resident, uh, played at Sayreville 2003 in that time, and uh, he's with us now to detail his experience at school. Matt, one of the big questions that keeps coming up is, you know, was this a systematic learned behavior? Was hazing a big part of the Sayreville experience that maybe now, unfortunately, went a little too far? Was there any hazing at all when you were there, even if it was just, you know, the, the typical silly hazing that happens with teams, with groups all the time? Was there any sort of a ritualized hazing that went on within the football program from when you were there? No, um, there wasn't. And again, I as something that I wrote in the piece on CBS Houston, if there was anybody that was going to be hazed, it was me. Um, I was small. I would have been easy. I would have been someone who was easy to take advantage of. Um, you know, I understand that I had a brother on the team who was the junior varsity quarterback who would later become the varsity quarterback for parts of seasons. Um, but it wasn't like I was off limits. It wasn't like I was protected. You know, I certainly had some friends who were upperclassmen um, who were friends only by extension through my brother. Um, but I also had friends on, on the team who were seniors and upperclassmen who were my own friends. Um, nothing like that ever happened. And, you know, I had a, num I had a conversation with a number of former players um, just to sort of a primer and just to bounce ideas off and, and, and make sure that we all remembered, you know, sort of the same story. And, I mean, I couldn't come up with anything. And I don't even, I don't, I don't mean, obviously nothing this egregious, but I, I mean even minor stuff. Um, it just wasn't, it just wasn't what we did. Um, you know, I'm sure that, I'm sure that there were, that there were jokes made. I'm sure that there were feelings hurt. I know that um, on occasion, I, mine were. Um, 
but you know there was there was nothing of the sort. And I think it's also important to remember that, um, you know, again, this is this is me having been in multiple locker rooms. I didn't see anything like this at the parochial school that I went to in the freshman locker room. I didn't see anything like this in the in the parochial school, in the varsity locker room. I also wrestled uh, for Sarah Bull, and I didn't see anything like this. I also played football for two years at the College of New Jersey uh, for parts of those two seasons, and there was there was nothing like this. Um, and so you know, I think that. I think that, again, we need to explore how the opportunities for these things to happen were created, how these, again, these systematic cracks were created, um, and, we, and we, need to, we need to close them up. But that being said, um, if it's true that these kids did what they did, you know, they need help. Um, that's, not, that's not normal behavior. That's not, um, that's not something that you give people space, and 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 this is what happens. It's I, I don't think it, it it may have been inevitable in that over time you were bound to come across somebody who was, you know, this dark and twisted and capable of something like that. But to say that, you know, that environment took good kids, made them bad, and these things happened is it's just not true. Um, so again, as we start to look forward at things we can do to change to make sure that that, that there are no more cerebrals. Um, I think there also is, is, is something to be said for the fact that, you know, if, 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 if these kids did um, what they're obliged to have done, you know, that's, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty disturbing statement about who they are as, uh, as people, even at a young age. Matt, a lot of what we keep hearing, whether in the comments section on NJ.com or local talk radio in New York, it's been a big topic. It's really been a big national topic, unfortunately. But a lot of what we're hearing is, is people call in or people write comments, and they're leaving thoughts that the culture in Sayreville, both in the town and in the school, kind of allows football players to do whatever they want to do because the team has been so successful. It's such a big part of the culture. We see this at times where you know some people feel entitled, they get away with things, and that could lead to some sort of behavior that's not acceptable. Did you experience that? What was the, the life like as a football player at Sayreville? I know you said you weren't you know, the star captain of the team, but you were around it. Was there entitlement for the football team at Sayreville? Is that, did that exist? At the time, it would have been pretty mild, if at all, only because the years that I were there um, as, as a student, I was there for, for three years as a player, I was there for one. Those were sort of the lean years of the program. The program had enjoyed some success before I got there and won some sectional uh, titles, and then they obviously, you know, they, they've done pretty well since. Um, but, you know, that, that, that sort of entitlement, that sort of culture wouldn't have necessarily um, been there. And I definitely think it's possible that over time and with the success that the program had, that, that 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 may have changed and that may have shifted. But to a certain degree, I think it's also important to remember, again, as we examine what happened in Cerebral and we make sure that we understand what happened in Cerebral so that we can make changes within Cerebral and the people who are responsible, whoever they are, whatever we thought about them before, are ultimately held responsible. But I think one thing that people really need to understand is just how, in so many ways, average Cerebral was. Cerebral was... Um, it was just very average. Cerebral as a town was average. It, it had average uh, racial and ethnic diversity, average socioeconomics, average um, everything. Um, Cerebral and its relationship to football, I would say, is average. You know, I, I understand that there, there, you know, there's frankly not a whole lot to do in Cerebral. You have the Starland Ballroom and you have things like Club Abyss, et cetera. Um, and so I understand that football was, was, a, was a, a major staple, but um, this isn't Odessa Permian in Dallas. This isn't De La Salle in California. This isn't Ohio, Florida, Pennsylvania. This isn't, you know, uh, uh, people, uh, mobs form outside the head coach's house if he loses a game. It's not, it's not like that. And the reason that I say that um, is that this could happen anywhere, and this can happen anywhere if there aren't changes that are made. And this isn't to defend or exonerate or okay what happened at Sarahville. Um, this is just to make sure that every administrator, every faculty member, every head coach across the country, if, if you're in any way influenced in a program, football or anything else, this is a wake-up call. And you need to take a really long and hard look at the way that you do things and just think of the possibilities. Um, you know, and again, that doesn't necessarily mean that we abolish programs or, or, any, or anything necessarily radical. Sometimes the smallest changes are the ones that, that yield and net the biggest results. But, you know, as much as we need to think about Sarahville, we also need to think about the possibilities nationally. 
Matt, last one for you, you know, because you have a unique perspective playing in different teams, playing in different schools, locker rooms. You know, I played at a small parochial school down in Tom's River. The locker room was maybe two rows, small school. Um, you know, even if the coaches weren't around, there just wasn't much area for anything, you know, close to this to happen without it being very obvious or, or you know, it, would, it, would, it wouldn't happen because there's no room for it. Big school, Sayerville, from what I understand. Uh, give us a little perspective from what you remember. How is the locker room set up? Is it a gigantic, you know, multiple rows? Is it, uh, you know, a normal locker room? So give us kind of an example from what you remember of just the way the locker room is set up because I, I find that part to be so confusing how this could happen in any locker room. Um, I think that there was there was definitely a fair amount of open space, um, and it, it was sort of both. There was There was some open space, but there were also a series of rows of lockers, and there would be lockers on each side, only one bench, so there were a number of tight quarters. And I think that's a good discussion to have, again, so that we can make sure that other things don't happen. But if we're understanding why this ha trying to understand why this happened at Saraville, um, you know, remember, like, understand the details of the report from NJ.com. When this would happen, students would alarm, you know, they would, they would send a signal uh, the seniors would send a signal to the freshmen, this is going to happen, we're doing this. It was almost like they wanted, they wanted to make sure that these kids knew what was coming so that they could almost create fear. And so the idea that maybe there were, there were tight cracks or things were out of fields of vision, I just don't really know how much that applies in, in this particular circumstance. I think, um, I think an important thing to, to look at and consider might be the distance from the, uh, the distance of the coach's office to the locker room. Um, it's my understanding that now um, there may be some laws or legislation that have been written that require that new facilities have a coach's lock, a coach's office next to the locker room. Um, but even then, to follow up on a discussion that we had earlier, even if something like this happened, and it, hap it happening once is once too many times, what happens inside the locker room, there should still be signs, there should still be symptoms, there should still be residue that spills out of the locker room, body language, facial expressions, um, and maybe even conversations, even if you know kids are just talking in vagaries and subtleties and, and not actually saying what's happening, but you can just kind of get a sense of they're talking about things that something's just off. Um, you know, and so again, uh, it's definitely a worthwhile question to think about how a locker room set up, the proximity from the locker room to the coach's office, but there's no easy answer. There's no simple fix. There's no, this guy was good, this guy was bad, this was right, this was wrong, this was built the right way, this was built the wrong way. Um, you know, if we're going to look at an issue like this, understand how it happened, and prescribe changes to make sure this never happens again, you have to look at it from a bigger picture approach, a holistic approach. Um, you know, and I think, I, I, I'm, the one thing I would say is I think that you know we've done a pretty good job of, of exploring a lot of those different things here in this chat today. So I think, um, you know, I think I think it definitely would make you know I, I think we, I think we've done a good thing. Well, Matt, I appreciate a few minutes. We appreciate a few minutes here in New Jersey. Good luck down in Houston. We appreciate a few minutes of your time, and uh, hopefully next time we talk, maybe we'll have some fun talking a little sports here and uh, and not have a topic like this. But appreciate it, Matt Hammond, CBSHouston.com. Uh, Thanks, Matt. Appreciate the time, Joe. Thank you for watching.